that to each of you here this morning. But to always see one another and to be able to be here and to, to be able to encourage one another, as I often say, <laughs> and to see, of course, those who are, I guess, visiting, we might say there, Dennis, uh, visiting uh, with us and, and has been uh, doing so, of course. Uh, Brother Dennis attends the congregation there in California, and, and of course we're glad to have him him here visiting with us, and, and of course any time, anyone comes uh, and, and visits with us, and I don't know whether to call you a visitor or not, James, I'll just call you, we got your picture up there out there, so I'll, I will call you a visitor today, but, but uh, it's good to see James, and of course uh, just to see uh, one another, it's always a joy, brothers and sisters, to to be able to, to be able to be here and, and to uh, worship the Lord. And, and please understand, everyone else, I'm not trying to leave anybody out. I'm glad to see each and every one of you here uh, today. And so I may mention someone by name, but, but I'm not trying to mention, uh, leave anybody out. Of course, some may be sitting there saying, I'm perfectly fine, Robert, don't mention my name. I don't want to hear my name mentioned. So whatever makes you happy. Uh, but we are glad to see you here and, and to know that we can come here and, and worship the Lord. If you will, bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, as we assemble here today to worship you, we pray that we may set aside the cares of this world. We pray, Father, that we may worship you in a pleasing manner, that we may always do so. Father, we pray that you'll watch over the ones who are here and that, that you'll help us and strengthen us and that we will always be uh, faithful and true to you, Father. We pray that we may have good health, that we may better serve you. And Father, we are mindful that, that of course, there are health concerns at uh, this time, and we do pray, as we have been, uh, for those who are affected. Uh, and, of course, all of us are affected in one way or another. And we just pray that this may pass quickly and that we may uh, grow in, in strength, spiritual strength, through uh, these, these times, Father. It is in Christ's most precious and holy name that we pray. Amen. I'm not sure I turned my phone down, so I did. But Jim does this, and, and Bill uh, does as well. They sometimes, sometimes I'll go to one of them and I'll mention that I want them to sing this particular song right before, maybe for an invitation song or, or whatnot. I did not ask Jim today, but I, I told Olivia that, that it fascinates me or, or, you know, I was thankful that he chose number 68. He didn't do it right before the lesson, but that's okay. He did that because I began my lesson this morning on and talking about that, that song, referencing that song. It's not on the song per se. But they count your blessings. We, we sing that song from time to time. And it is a song that we should think about and, and be encouraged by. And, and it, we should let it encourage us to do just what it says. Count your blessings. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Brothers and sisters, I have many things for which I am thankful. There are many things in this world which I am thankful for. And I, I know, brothers and sisters, as I, I stand here, that there are more than I could stand here in, in a whole day, much less in, in a few moments, and list all. I am thankful, brothers and sisters, uh, for Christ and, and the redemption that we have through Him. We know, of course, that we have redemption through Christ. Uh, and, and so we, we should be, uh, we ought to be thankful for uh, those blessings. I am thankful for Olivia. And I, I, I have to say that, I've said it many times, she is her father's joy. And, and she brings great joy to my life. And I am so thankful uh, for her. Today's lesson is actually written prepared for her of sorts uh, and, and is referencing her. It is a lesson, the title of it is Blank Space. Jerry was asking me, could I take any song and do a lesson? I was actually talking to a co-worker here uh, recently about that, that sometimes that, that they, 
you know, you have to think about it. Today's lesson, Blank Space, is from a Taylor Swift song. A certain little blonde-haired, blue-eyed uh, kid likes Taylor Swift very much, and I have to admit, though I don't agree with her political views, and, and I would be much happier if she would stop speaking sometimes about her, her thoughts, uh, every thought. Uh, this is something I learn the more I get, the older I get, although I still have to work at it. Not every thought that comes through our head needs to be shared with other people, do they? And, and sometimes we, we need to remember that. But she, I have to admit, she is a very talented singer. She, she has many songs that I enjoy listening to, not all of them. And this particular one is not one that I enjoy per se, but it is blank space. And Olivia was asking me to, because uh, I was sitting and talking with her about this year, as I've said on numerous occasions, I'm using song titles, not necessarily speaking about the songs themselves, but using the titles in reference to uh, some biblical lesson. And, and in reference to what Jerry asked, could you take any one? It took me a little time to think about what am I going to talk about with blank space. I'm certainly not going to talk about what she's singing about because it is of no real value to us. It, it is, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that and say it's no value to us. Uh, but, brothers and sisters, I got to thinking about it, and there is a great lesson that we can learn that we can learn from this lesson. And we need to understand it very well. And, and I want her to see these things and to understand these things. And, and many of you might say, well, Robert, these things don't really affect me at this point in my life. And, and that may yeah. or may not be true, but we will see, brothers and sisters, that children are a blessing from God. You need to understand that. Children are a blessing from God. They are a great responsibility, and this may sound silly, but they are a blank space. And, and that is not an insult to kids, and as I go through today's lesson, you'll understand what I am saying when I say they are a blank space. We begin by understanding that our children are truly a blessing from God. If we did not understand that of our own accord, brothers and sisters, we would very easily see and understand that from reading God's <laughs> Word. It on numerous occasions teach us that children are truly a blessing from God. In Genesis chapter 33 and verse 5, Genesis 33 and verse 5, we see here, of course, this is Esau and, and uh, Jacob, Israel, we might say, being reunited. You know the, the events of this. Hopefully we all know this, that, that uh, Jacob had tricked Esau, and Esau was very unhappy about this and decided, well, Daddy's going to die pretty soon. Apparently, Daddy didn't die for quite a few years after this, but he said, Daddy's going to die, and when he dies, I'm going to take care of my brother. And he wasn't meaning in a good way. He was going to kill him. And, and so Jacob was sent away, told to flee, and he flees and goes and, and, and stays with his uncle and, of course, marries uh, his uncle's two daughters, his cousins, as we, we note. And, and here he is returning, and he is fearful of what Esau will do to him. And, and here they come together and, and we see in verse 5, And he lifted up his eyes and saw the women and the children, Esau seeing the women and children, Jacob's wives and his children, and said, Who are these with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. This is Jacob saying. He was recognizing that these were gifts of God. These were, these were things that these were his children and they were given to him of God. Genesis 48 and verse 9. We likewise see in Genesis 48 and, and verse 9. And Joseph said unto his father, They are my sons whom God hath given me in this place. 
And he said, Bring them, I pray thee, unto me, and I will bless them. Of course, this is the event of, of Jacob, or, or Israel, is about to die, and Joseph has been reunited. And, and so we, we find here that the events here is that he is asking, uh, Jacob at this point can't see very well, and he's asking, Who are these two? And Joseph is recognizing that these are, are, are children, these are gifts of God. Je Joshua 24. One of my favorite verses, of course, is Joshua 24 and verse 15, but in verse 3 of this text we see, And I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood and led him throughout all the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. God recognized, testifying, stating that he gave Isaac to him. You remember, how old was Abraham? How old was Sarah when Isaac was born? He was, nine, he was a, a hundred. She was 90, I believe it was. 90, 91, something like that. Brothers and sisters, how many people, and, and I know we don't have anyone of that age, but we have some who are getting uh, closer to that age, and how many people get up around 100, get up around 90, and are thinking, as I, I said just recently, are thinking, you know, I think we'll have some more children. I don't know of many people who, who, who are like that, who think like that. And, and we need to understand that. And my aunt I mentioned was turned 91 the other day. Brothers and sisters, she has children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, and yes, great-great-grandchildren. Her grandchildren have grandchildren, brothers and sisters. I can assure you, my aunt, it doesn't cross her mind of having additional children. It's not a thought that she's planning on. That's not something she is. She's 91. She's around the age that, that Sarah was. And, and so it's not a thought that goes through her mind. But, but Abraham and Sarah, at their age, had a son. This was a gift from God brothers and sisters, and we need to understand that. He was a gift from God. The 113th Psalm. The psalmist in Psalm 113 and verse 9. We see here, uh, Psalm 113 and verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. Brothers and sisters, that text should make us think of someone specifically, shouldn't it? Shouldn't that, in fact, make us think of Hannah? You remember Hannah there in 1 Samuel chapter 1? Hannah was married and her husband had two wives and one of his wives had children and Hannah, his other wife, didn't. Couldn't have children, apparently. She was barren. And Hannah was tormented by the other wife. The other wife took pleasure, apparently, in, in boasting how she had children and Hannah didn't. And Hannah, of course, prays to God. And, and God, we know, she makes this promise, if you, Lord, will give me a child, I'll give him to you to serve you all his life. She followed through on that, too, by the way. But God gave her, gave this woman who was barren a child and was able. And, and of course, she followed through and God gave her additional children after this. God can bless, can give uh, so much. And in the 127th Psalm, Psalm 127, and beginning with verse 3, Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is His reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with enemies in the gate. Brothers and sisters, children are a blessing to parents. I know sometimes that some parents may think, you know, I don't see how they're much of a blessing. My parents probably on more than one occasion looked at me and, and my brothers and sisters, because we, we were a large family, and they probably more than once looked at us and thought, a blessing? Really? 
Maybe you can look at your life and think, well, I've probably given my parents that thought as well. A, a blessing? Really? You know, maybe, maybe they, they've thought that away. Children can sometimes be, be, be frustrating. We know we can be a, as children. We, we do that, but they are. Children are a true blessing. And, and brothers and sisters, I am truly thankful for my child, knowing that to me she is a blessing in so many ways and truly brings great joy to my life. Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 6. And brothers and sisters, this goes for some who are perhaps older. Proverbs 17 and verse 6. Children's children, grandchildren, by the way, children's children are the crown of old men and the glory of children are their fathers. Children truly a blessing. And, and grandchildren, I, I've actually heard some people say grandchildren are better than children. I don't know. I, I haven't reached that point. Uh, but, but uh, I'm kind of surprising a certain child when I say that. But, you know. But children, brothers and sisters, are wonderful. And grandchildren, I, I know uh, that grandchildren are a great joy. Uh, I think of, of my daughter and her grandparents love her very much, I'm certain. And, and of course, she was able to talk to uh, her, her other grandfather just last night and all, and, and, and I'm sure they enjoyed that. And, and I know from uh, knowledge when, when my dad, before he passed, of course, that he thought very highly of her and, and, and loved her dearly. And, and so grandchildren are a blessing, aren't they? Brothers and sisters, friends, we need to understand that our children are a blessing from God. They're a gift from God. And we, we should count them as such. But brothers and sisters, when we are children, think back to when you were a child. And, and you got some new toy. And it was a joy, wasn't it? And maybe we, we got some toy, and how long was it before we probably tore that toy up? We took, didn't take care of it, and it got torn up, and we didn't, we, and probably upset our parents. Maybe they spent some money on it, and, and here we are not taking care of it. But our children, brothers and sisters, they are a great gift to us, but they are a great responsibility to us as well. We need to understand that and, and make certain that we are bringing them up right, we might say, bringing them up in the right way. We see, of course, that the Bible in numerous texts teaches us about our responsibility as parents. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4. In fact, we see here uh, in this, this verse, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. We ought to bring them up, nurture them, brothers and sisters. We nurture our children and yes, admonish them. We warn them. We confront them neuthetically, as, as I've, I've talked about recently in, in looking at the word uh, admonish and, and what is meant by there, that we are confronting them spiritually, letting them know what they need to do, correcting them when they, they need to be corrected, as we, as we will see. But we are to bring them up. We are to nurture them. Admonition of the Lord, the nurture of the Lord. Titus chapter 2 and verse 4. We see, of course, there instructions to the older ladies and, and by extension to the younger ladies as well. Uh, the older ladies uh, there beginning in verse 3 are to teach the younger women. Teach them what? That they may teach the young women, verse 4, to be sober, to love their husbands, to love their children. Now, these two verses, we think of Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 4, Fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, see there, that's the responsibility of Dad. There, he has to bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And, and Titus 2 and verse 4, Moms, you're supposed to love your children, so Dad doesn't love his children. Moms aren't to nurture their children, aren't to uh, guide them, help them, 
uh, to learn more about God's will, we understand, brothers and sisters, that these verses don't exclude the other. Yes, Ephesians 6, 4 places that responsibility upon dad. But mom has that responsibility as well. Yes, children are to be loved by their mother, but can we doubt that our, our father, that fathers are supposed to love their children? We understand that. And anyone who has had a child, I assure you, if they, if they are remotely the people they ought to be, that they love their children. Now I realize there are people out there who are hateful and abusive and, and harmful and, and, and we understand that, but, but if we are anywhere remotely where we ought to be, we love our children, don't we? Even when they frustrate us, even when we, uh, when we get angry at them, we still love them. I'm guessing, I know I've told Olivia this, there's nothing, nothing she could do that would stop me from loving her. I'm guessing every one of us have probably at one time or another said that to our children in some form or fashion, that no matter what our children may do, sometimes they don't listen. Sometimes we don't listen, we understand that, but sometimes our children don't listen. Sometimes, you know, when we were kids, how many times did we get into trouble? I'm sure my mom just, just hated to have to spank me whenever I would try to set the yard on fire. Yes, I've done that. I've, I've tried, and actually, I, after I got grown, I did set part of my property, bought, bought a nice new piece of property, and learned a very valuable lesson. Dry grass burns just as rapidly as gasoline does. Don't strike a match around it. And so we, we need to understand that sometimes we, we do things that are, are stupid, and we do things that are harmful, but our parents... And as parents, we, ought to, we are to still love our children. We are to train them. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. Proverbs 22 and verse 6. We are taught uh, to, to train our children up the way that they should go. Train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from him. You know, this is a broad statement. There are exceptions to the rule, I guess you could say. There are people who are brought up and they still don't make the right choices. They still go in the wrong direction. We probably all could think back to various individuals who, who we could look and say that their, their mom, their dad were good, uh, godly people who taught their children and look what happened. They still didn't do what they should have done. Brothers and sisters, we need to understand sometimes we don't make the choices that our parents taught us to follow. I know I haven't always made the right choices in my life, and, and I'm sure many of you could say that as well, but we are to train our children up in the way that they should go. Teach them, brothers and sisters. We are to teach them. Deuteronomy chapter 6. We read there from Deuteronomy chapter 6, of course, and... and and noticed in, in verses 4 and following, and we'll not here uh, reread through all of this, but if we, if we look in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4, you know, we see verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. But brothers and sisters, Moses doesn't end there. Moses doesn't say you are to love your children. We often talk about this. Jesus gave essentially the same commandment there in Matthew 22, uh, verses 37 through 39. We know that, that he lays these instructions out and we need to keep that in mind, brothers and sisters, that we are to love our children. We are to or we are to be faithful, that is. We are to do what God would have us. Love God with all of our heart, all of our mind, all of our soul. But brothers and sisters, we also learn something else, don't we? We are to teach these things to our children. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. We are to have them and we are to teach them to our children. We are to guide them uh, show them these words. Moses is telling the, the Israelites they were to follow these things. And I love this text, brothers and sisters. Think about what he says. You know, these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt 
Talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Essentially, this should be in your mouth, teaching other people. In Bible class, Olivia and I were talking about, and our lesson was on letting our light shine. And how we do that? How do we let our light shine? How, we, how do we shine forth Christ? By telling people about Him. By talking about Jesus. By, by sharing the good news. You know, how many things... I asked her this question. How many... What, what do we talk about often? I, I mentioned, of course, something I enjoy talking about. I like talking about baseball. I'm not real happy right now. No baseball going on. But, but I like talking about baseball. But brothers and sisters, I ought to like talking about Jesus. I ought, to, I ought to like talking about God. I ought to like talking about His Word. Telling people about Him. I've, I've made, I, I don't know, maybe a friend there at work and he and I talk and, and I've invited him to come and, and all, but he and I talk and he's been giving me some pointers on some thoughts as far as some, some songs that he would like to hear, you know, he would like for me to speak about and, and, and I'm encouraging him, okay, I've got one picked out kind of along the lines of what he talked about and whenever I preach it, I want him to come hear it. Brothers and sisters, we ought to talk about Jesus. We, we say we love Him. We, we often talk about, well, we talk about loving God and, and that means we obey Him. But, but we ought to want to talk about people. If Jesus is so important in my life, I ought to want to tell other people about Him, right? Olivia is important in my life. I like talking about her. I like telling people about her. Telling people she is her father's joy. Of course, a, a reference to her, well, one of her middle names. Uh, that, that she was named, the name I picked out, that means Father's joy. This, this is something I enjoy talking about. I ought to enjoy telling about Jesus. Jesus brings joy to me, brothers and sisters. Jesus brings salvation to me, and I ought to want to tell people about that. He saved me through His sacrifice. And that sacrifice makes salvation available to everyone else. And I don't want to tell other people, you can have that salvation too. You can have that peace that I have. You can have that joy that I have. You can have those things. We ought to be wanting to tell our children about that, brothers and sisters. You know, I, I desire to try to teach other people who are out in the world and try to tell them about Christ and try to bring them to salvation. What about my own child? Shouldn't I desire to have her obey the gospel? And I assure you, she knows my desire on that. From a small child, and kind of jumping ahead here in a moment, but for a moment, but but I remember bringing her home, and I, I remember walking up and down the little hallway in the house we lived in when when she was born, and, and I remember holding her and singing to her. I still do that. I still sing to her. And, and wrote my own little Jesus Loves song, which I still sing to her. I started that when she was a, just a few days old, brothers and sisters, singing that song to her. And, and, and hopefully that did at that time and still does bring comfort to her. In hearing that, that those words, as we all, all understand, those words teach. Jesus loves Olivia. And we need to understand, Jesus loves, and you can put your name into that. I can put my name into that. Jesus loves Robert. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves you. Jesus loves us all. And we ought to teach our children these things, brothers and sisters. I don't teach her the old law that she needs to go follow the old law. I teach her what she needs to understand, what she needs to obey. And, and we ought to be doing that. And there's numerous texts that teach us. That. Here's one that won't be very politically correct. How about that we ought to control our children? We often think that, that well, you know, we, we don't, uh, you shouldn't control your children. We probably hear that on, on TV, right? Don't control, you shouldn't be so controlling of your children. You shouldn't control them, really. Seriously? You ever see a child that's out of control? 
And sometimes they need a little controlling, don't they? And, and, and sometimes it's just give them a look, right? Give them a look. And they understand what you mean. I know, I know someone who understands sometimes when I give her a little look and, and, and she, get, she understands that look and, and I'm sure we as, parent, as, as children understood when our parents gave us a little look. It was, it was time, you know, sometimes it's stop and, 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 and we keep going but sometimes dad or mom gives us that look and okay, now I got that look. It, okay, it's time to stop, right? It's time to, to knock it off, to quit carrying on and and, and getting into trouble. First Timothy chapter 3, we see, of course, how that Paul here is talking about the, the, the elders and the, the responsibility. But notice in 1 Timothy 3 and verse 4, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection, under control, we might say, with all gravity. And understand, as we've talked about before, you don't have to be an elder for that to apply to you. Elders are to meet these qualifications prior to becoming elders. I, as a father, am to keep my child under control, in subjection. I am to make sure she understands what is acceptable and not acceptable. We need to understand that, brothers and sisters. Correcting. Proverbs 13 and verse 24. Uh, Proverbs. I, I, the Proverbs is a book that we probably don't spend much time in. And one we should spend a lot more time in. One that should, we should study and, and, and teach and, and, and know because it is wisdom, brothers and sisters. How many of us want wisdom? We often pray for wisdom, right? Well, where do you find wisdom? You find it in God's Word. And here's a good book to start with, to find wisdom. In, in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24, He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. He that spareth the rod spoils the child, right? We often hear that. I, I've said before, I remember, and I, I think I mentioned this here just recently, that, that um, I've often said that Oh, that was in there, and I remember looking for it, and Brother Don Boyd correcting me and pointing out that that doesn't, isn't in the Bible. You won't find it. He that spareth the rod spoils the child. It's not in there. We somehow got in our minds that it is, but it isn't. But here we find that, that in fact, he that spares the rod hates his child. And understand that doesn't mean go out and get a big stick and start beating on your children. But the rod of correction, right? Correcting our children, setting them straight. Sometimes that means uh, disciplining, and sometimes that means spanking. And then I understand that there comes a point where, where spanking isn't useful, isn't as, as handy, and there's other means of, of punishment. Not everyone agrees with spanking. I understand that. But whether you agree with spanking or not, the bottom line is correct your children. Sometimes, and in, uh, I, I, I've said... Some of you will remember I've said uh, some years ago, uh, I'm sure, that, that I remember as a, a kid being told, this is going to hurt me worse than you. And I thought my parents, or, or any adult that ever said that, was just lying and, and stupid. And then you have children and you realize, this hurts me more than it hurts you. You know, it hurts physically. It hurts the kids will bother them as you give them a swat. But it hurts us to spank them, doesn't it? It is hurtful and upsetting to have to do that. But sometimes we do have to correct them. It is our responsibility to correct them when it is needed. In, in Proverbs 19 and verse 18, we find here, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crime. That is a good bit of wisdom, isn't it? Chasten them, correct them, punish them when there's hope, when there's an opportunity. Because if we don't, guess what? As I as and her mother have told Olivia, you know, it's either we correct you now when you are small, 
or someday you're going to grow up and somebody else is going to set you straight. It may be the police who may lock you up. It may be because you broke some law and now you're in jail or something. It may be somebody that you just say the wrong thing to. And they teach you a valuable lesson, right? They teach you a very valuable lesson that you can't push everybody around. There's always somebody bigger and badder, we might say. We can look at others on correcting. Proverbs 22, 15, 23, 13. These texts teach us this. And we see, brothers and sisters, various examples. Abraham, who was looked favorably upon by God because God knew what? Knew he would bring his children up the right way. David in 1 Kings 9 and verse 4, it, it, you know, David is set forth as an example. 2 Chronicles 17 and verse 13, Jehoshaphat is, is said to have done what? You ever read these books, the Kings and the Chronicles? Uh, you know, you read Samuel, the books of Samuel. You, you read these books, and what do you read about? You read about these kings. You read about the good kings, those who were good in Judah, and then there were some that were evil. And all the Israelite kings, the northern kingdom, they were all wicked. Not one of them were good. All of them did evil. But what do you often find in reference to there in the, the book, in these books about when they say, well, Jehoshaphat or Asa, this was a good king. How were they good kings? It's often said they were good kings like their father, David. Now, David wasn't there all of their dad. In some, you know, these were kings who were his. His, of course, he had a son who who became king, and then and then a and then, uh, grandson, and, and so forth, and down through the line there in Judah. And, and they are referenced back to David. David did what he was supposed to. He was a man after God's own heart. And keep in mind, David did some very bad things too. We know about his adultery with Bathsheba and his killing Uriah to try to cover it up. We understand that, and we, we see that that is the case. So he wasn't perfect, but, but David was a man after God's own heart because when he understood his sin, he corrected his sin. And he strived to follow after God. And he instructs his children to do that, right? Brothers and sisters, children are a great responsibility. They're a blessing. They're a great responsibility. They are, and here's where we get to our title, blank space. They are a blank space. They're a blank space. What do we mean? I mentioned there about whenever Libby was born, and, and I, I would hold her and, and walk her up and down the hallway, and I would sing to her, and of course you... you you burp them and all, and you're doing all this. And, and, and I would sing to her, even from a very small, just a few days old, I was singing to her gospel songs. Brothers and sisters, when babies are born, and this is true for every one of us, I'm not singling anyone out, when they're born, they're a blank space. They're empty. They're a blank slate, we might say. That's probably something we're a little more familiar with and uh, we're a little bit older. They're a blank slate. How so? Because they don't really know anything, do they? What does a baby know how to do? They know how to eat, right? I have an idea about that. Eat, sleep, and we know the other. And that's basically what a baby does for a while. And then they learn, of course, the physical things. They learn how to walk, hopefully, if there's nothing you know, that, that is hindering their doing so. And if they are a reasonable, normal child, they, they learn various lessons, even as... It is an amazing thing, brothers and sisters. We, we sometimes underestimate our children. We think, well, they, they're, they're small, and so they can't learn. They learn a lot, and in a hurry. They learn a great deal. And understand this, brothers and sisters... We mentioned some examples there. Understand they are learning by watching you. They're learning by watching me. 
What are we teaching our children? It's not enough just to tell them these things. We must show them these things. We must set this example for them. We must, we must teach them the right way to go. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 31 and verse 13. And that their children which have not known anything. Notice there children that have not known anything may hear and learn to fear the Lord your God as long as you live in the land whither you go over Jordan to possess it. Brothers and sisters, we send our kids to school. Right now, I know school is out, uh, but, but we send them to school to learn things, right? Reading, writing, and arithmetic. Brothers and sisters, we have a responsibility to teach them something that in the end is much more valuable to them than those three things. The Bible. Those things are good to know. But in the end, those things aren't going to get them to heaven, is it? The, the Bible, the truth, the Word of God, the light of God is going to get them to heaven. It is the way to teach them the things they need to know. And we need to make certain that we are teaching them these things. In Isaiah 28 and verse 9, Isaiah 28 and verse 9, we read here, Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. There, there is a point, even, even a, again, a few days old, I, I remember singing these things and hopefully implanting, beginning to implant those thoughts into her mind at that age. Teaching her these things. But, but we understand that there are some things that are beyond. I, you can't, like we've talked about, you can't go feed a baby, a newborn baby. When she was brought home, I couldn't get a grill up a steak and take it and put it on a plate and set it before her and say, here Olivia, enjoy this nice, well done steak. She, I, I'm giving her a little brief. She liked her, her steaks a little raw. Uh, not like her dad who likes them well done. But, but you know, I, I couldn't give her a, a steak and hope she's going to eat these things. Well, there are some things I can't teach a small infant, Right? We have to teach as they grow, but it is a continual process that is going on, filling their mind and teaching them the way that they should go, filling their hearts and their minds the right way. Because understand, brothers and sisters, if I'm not filling her mind with the right things, if I'm not filling her heart, if we as parents are not filling our children's hearts and minds with the right thing, there are plenty of people who will fill it with the wrong things. Who will teach them the wrong thing. Teach them to disrespect God. Teach them to dishonor God. Teach them and tell them there is no God. There are numerous people who will curse God before their little hearts, their little eyes and ears. There are people in this world who will fill their minds and their hearts with wickedness if we aren't filling them with goodness. And we need to keep that in mind. We need to make certain that we are teaching our children. And maybe we look and say, well, my children are all grown and I wish I had done better and I wish I had done these things. Brothers and sisters, do it now. Your children may be grown. I know there are some in here who have children who are grown, who have grandchildren who are grown. But you can be telling them now, you can be letting them know, hey, I, I want you to do this. This is the right way. This is the way you should go. This is the way that, that is right. And I, I know I, I could have done this earlier. I know that I haven't always done this. But I want you to make the right choice. I want you to obey God's will. I want you to be a Christian. I want you to be a faithful Christian. We can be teaching them these things. And we do so by speaking of them when we're sitting, speaking of them when we're rising up, speaking of them every day by 
putting them on our mailbox, we might say, by putting them as frontlets. We don't wear frontlets, the little things that the Israelites would wear there, but, but you know, by putting them out there and letting our children know the truth. I have let my daughter know. I don't mind saying here today, and I don't try to single her out, but I have let her know my desire to see her make the choice that when she is ready, when it is the right time, when, when she is, uh, reaches that point of accountability, to make the choice to obey God's will, to become a Christian, to live the, a faithful Christian life. And I pray about these things, brothers and sisters, and I hope and pray that I am doing and getting better at teaching her these things. Letting her know that I desire, and what's more, God desires for her to be saved. Each of us ought to be doing that. Each of us ought to be letting our light shine with our children and with everyone else's, for that matter. This evening, this morning, if you're here, if you haven't obeyed the gospel, I would encourage you to do so. We'll be glad to help you to, to obey the gospel. You must hear the word, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, confess Him as the Son of God, and be baptized, immersed in water for the remission of your sins. We'll be glad to help you do that. If you're here and need to obey the gospel, we would encourage you and plead with you to do so. Or maybe you're here and you're a Christian. Maybe something was said in today's lesson or maybe something unrelated to today's lesson. You, you look and you know you haven't been what you need to be and you, you need to correct that. He's promised if we will confess our faults, He'll forgive us of our faults. But it's up to us to make that choice. If you're here today, if you have need, we encourage you and plead with you to come while we stand and while we sing. Heart to the gentle voice of Jesus calling.